Some of my earliest and fondest memories are of playing video games at the arcade, a chief staple among my favorites being the Marvel fighting games by Capcom, a handful of which featured Shuma Gara as a playable character. As just a young consumer of Marvel media at the time, I recognized the likes of Spider-Man and Hulk, but this ball of tentacles really drew me in, despite the fact that I knew nothing of his origins, the solid neon color of his sprite that made him pop on screen, the hypnotic way his tentacles move even as he stays in neutral position, the way he could transform for special moves on the spot. Capcom's sprite work during its fighting game heyday could not be matched, and their depiction of Shuma Garoth is a prime example of the work they'd put in. Despite having no physical face to speak of outside of a single gazing eyeball, Shumagaroth was capable of a great deal of expression with wind poses that expose a contempt for these lowly mortals and, of all traits to humanize an ultrad bundle of tentacles, a sassy nature. Playing as Shumagaroth in the arcade made me love him, and only later would I have the means to learn where he came from the Doctor Strange comics, where he appeared as a foe of the titular superhero, as one of the Old Ones, ancient beings that predate the Earth, of whom Shumagaroth was often said to be the most powerful. A Lord of Chaos, Shumagaroth is so strong that when he appears on the mortal plane, it's usually a sorcerer like Nicholas Scratch or a reluctant Doctor Strange himself invoking a fraction of his true power the mere presence of which in our dimension causes anyone in his vicinity to collapse in agony on the spot, let alone Shumagaroth's full power when confronted in his home realm, where the Chaos Lord is practically unstoppable. Then, uh, Shumagaroth made his film debut in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and he has no dialogue, and the fight with Doctor Strange that lasts for five or so minutes before he's scratched off the census because he got poked in the eye too hard. And yes, I'm sure one of you is going to slink into the comments to pull the rug out from under me and point out that this character is canonically named in the MCU particularly as Gargantos, after another large octopus guy from the comics, but the writing on the wall is beyond clear that this is supposed to be Shuma Garoth. The makers of this movie have said as much that Shuma Garoth's name, which is rooted in classic fantasy literature, created rights issues, and for Christ's sake, this is a Doctor Strange movie, and Gargantos is from the Submariner comics, so let's stop drinking the legally distinct Kool-Aid and call a spade a spade here. They probably didn't even think it mattered too much, considering no character refers to the demon in question by any name. He's simply dismissively called the Octopus. Am I bitter? Maybe just a little. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness was a divisive movie, and I was on the saltier end of that debate, but not for any of the actual meaningful discussion going on of Steven or Wanda's characterization. No, no. I was mad about my calamari boy. In the interest of good faith, I think Multiverse of Madness does a lot of things really well, including the parts where you can tell the man himself, Sam Raimi, was allowed to grip the steering wheel and create some interesting and spooky imagery and set pieces. Sadly, no matter how distinguished the recipe is, is, even the most exquisite souffle won't impress someone who doesn't like souffles, and I don't like MCU movies for the most part, and the most persistent ingredient that these movies call for time and time again that leaves a bad taste in my mouth is the irreverence these movies often carry for the comic book origins of these characters. Look, I'm not gonna act like Shuma Garoth is entitled to top billing just because I like him, or that I'm entitled to an authentic and verbose adaptation of the character just because I have some idea of what that might look like. Shuma Garoth is powerful and memorable, but he appeared in the comics pretty infrequently, too. Some would say I should be grateful such an esoteric character was in a movie at all, but let me level with where I'm coming from. I wouldn't be that invested or even overly aware of Shuma Garoth if it weren't for his depictions in the Marvel vs. Capcom games, where he was celebrated as a playable fighter in a narrow lineup and drawn and animated with a ton of love and expression. Playing a fighting game as a wacky, quivering tentacle monster introduced me to a whole avenue of comics and supervillains, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that, but I want to ask, did anyone have their horizons and minds excited by Shumagaroth's depiction 
in Multiverse of Madness the way me and many others were in the Capcom games. You may ask, is that even a germane scale to apply to a character who's, who's only scripted to appear for one short fight scene? Would anyone care one way or the other about Shuma Garoth considering he's only supposed to be in the movie for five or so minutes? To that, I want to cite last year's Suicide Squad movie directed by James Gunn, which shortly after releasing saw a huge spike in fandom wikia searches for many characters, distinctly Black Guard and Weasel, two characters with similarly obscure comic book roots about the same amount of screen time as Shuma Garoth. The difference is that James Gunn, in his typical house style, fully embraced the strangeness of these characters, having both overflowed with personality in the short time we got to know them. They aren't one-to-one -one adaptations of their comic book counterparts, but their memorable aesthetics and idiosyncratic dispositions made it clear that these weren't villains pulled to check a box, the way Shuma Goroth being thrown into Multiverse of Madness as an obligatory first act KO absolutely does. Gun's takes on characters like Weasel is so specific, pointed, and strange that even after their pretty thankless role in the movie, it's clear people were still thinking of them, a fate that was not shared by Shuma Goroth when my experience with Capcom's direction of the character proves it absolutely could have. This issue permeates throughout Multiverse of Madness in particular in their handling of the Illuminati. The Illuminati? <laughs> Here we meet the self-serious superheroes of the alternate Earth, where Doctor Strange is quick to mock present company. Fantastic word. Didn't you guys chart in the 60s? Is this a joke to you? Well, there's a guy over there with a fork on his head, so yeah, a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Steven. Are Reed Richards and Black Bolt too corny for the magician superhero doctor who wears the magic carpet from Aladdin around his neck? Pot kettle much? This isn't me clutching my pearls that Doctor Strange was mean to superheroes for wearing costumes, but I feel it's rather indicative of the embarrassment Multiverse of Madness and many Marvel movies wear on their sleeve of their pulpier comic book roots. Black Bolt and Reed Richards here are already portrayed in pretty subdued manners for fully costumed superheroes in this movie, and yet the writing still feels downright anxious to crack the window and assure the broader audience that we all know it's silly. It's silly that one of Marvel's strongest and most lore-rich heroes is now being wasted in ten or so minutes. Look at him, he has a fork on his head! It's fine that he's dead now, or serious movies. Let's compare again to a similar matter in The Suicide Squad. Characters get fun poked at them, that's not off limits, especially when it's an elephant in the room to the degree characters as ridiculous as these begets. But the characters in terms of their powers and their costumes are outlandish enough to justify the matter, and any jokes at their expense is still second to learning a bit about them before they're carted off to be reacquainted with their maker. Captain Boomerang's friendship with Harley, TDK's affinity for Mr. Pib of all things, Javelin's flirtatiousness. It's small but crucial character building like this that makes the swiftly killed Suicide Squad members sort of rehabilitated cult favorites, and the Illuminati, reflected on by MCU fans, largely as a bunch of stooges who got what was coming to them for underestimating the Scarlet Witch. The Suicide Squad endears you to the characters so it can break your heart a bit when reality puts them in the ground, whereas the Illuminati feels so largely milquetoast and neutered as if the movie is acting selectively with who you're supposed to care about. And the problem with the latter approach is that in a connected franchise such as this, it doesn't beget very much interest in lesser known characters. When an adaptation of an incredibly minor Booster Gold villain is more memorable than that of a superhero who was once one of Marvel's headliners, you have a serious problem. I feel like I don't have to reach all that far to show Marvel proves this themselves. Villains like Loki and Thanos may not be one-to-one -one with their comic selves also, but they were allowed to embrace colorful costumes and lofty toyetic weapons accompanying their supervillain ideals. On the other hand, when's the last time you've heard anyone talk about Black Widow's Taskmaster? People love the comic version who dresses like a spirit Halloween display and is quick-witted and talkative of personality, but they of course had to drain the character of color, literally and figuratively, for our grounded spy thriller. And let's also again not forget to poke fun at the characters who do end up truly rooted to their comic origins, because we can't forget to remind the audience that we find this silly, too. You got fat. <laughs>
What I'm trying to illustrate is this. Mediums adapting superhero characters have a platform to introduce strange and obscure characters to a massive new audience. Not every character is going to have excessive screen time, but many outings have proven that this much focus isn't necessary to create a really memorable portrayal. If a pixel sprite depiction of a little known character could impact me so much as a little kid that I'm complaining on the internet at the age of 25 about it, imagine what could be done with a feature film budget, and to that same degree, my disappointment when the matter was utterly squandered. I am just begging that even for just a few minutes of screen time, you need to remember that a character has a name and a voice. He's not the octopus, he's Shuma Gurath, and he fucking rules.